Hello everybody, Nitsa Gamer here to literally waste my time for your own entertainment. In Persona 5 Royal, you must fight demons in a supernatural world while hanging out with your friends in your day-to-day -day life. And while it's always a unique experience to play this wonderful game, it does get easier the more times you play it. Which is why we have so many challenge runs of this game ranging from a no social stat run, a no persona run, joker and arson only on merciless run, no grinding run, a no attacking run, and getting to level 99 in the first palace. But what if we played the ultimate minimalist challenge of Persona 5 Royal by having Joker be lazy and unreliable and instead rely on everyone else to solve the problems for us? You know, do the exact opposite of what Persona 5 is about. Can you be Persona 5 Royal by doing absolutely nothing? This story is a work of fiction. If you took the title too literally, the obvious answer is no. Obviously, we have to play the game in order to make progress in the story. So what are the rules for doing absolutely nothing? Well, the rules will be split into four different categories. The rules for pausing, the rules for the Velvet Room, the rules for the real world, and the rules for the metaverse. When it comes to pausing, the rule is that we must never do something to change the game's mechanics. That means no using skills, no using items or skill cards, no changing of equipment, no changing personas, and no changing who my party members are. The only thing we're allowed to touch is returning back to the title screen or reloading our save file. We can check our stats, but changing them is completely banned. When it comes to the Velvet Room, pretty much everything about the Velvet Room is off-limits. That means no fusing, no strengthening, no itemizing, no lockdowns, no registry, no challenge battles, and no penal labor. There will be only one moment in the game where we have to fuse a persona for a tutorial, but aside from that, the Velvet Room is off-limits and will be for story purposes only. In the real world, we must make Joker be as lazy as possible or a big fan of the cognitive world. That means, unless we must do something for story progression, there's only two things we're allowed to do during the daytime. Go into the metaverse or head straight to LeBlanc for the night. And at nighttime, we can only go to bed. We camp on with confidants, do activities to raise our social stats, train or meditate for HP and SP gain, watch clothes, do shopping, the home shopping program, or craft infiltration tools. Considering the real world is how we prepare our heroes to take on the metaverse, we will be put at a severe disadvantage. And when it comes to the metaverse, obviously we have to do anything that requires story progression. We have a choice of either going to the palace or mementos for grinding. We're allowed to start a battle with an ambush, and we're allowed to open up chests in the metaverse, but locked chests are completely banned. We are banned from talking to Jose and using his shop or changing the cognition for more EXP gain, therefore banned from collecting stamps. We are banned from doing any optional mementos requests. We are banned from swapping party members at the entrance. And when it comes to combat, we are banned from using any action except for guarding and all-out attacks. All party members must be set on act freely, so we have to play Persona 5 in Persona 3 style, but without doing anything to help our party members. Outside of a few rare exceptions where we must use Joker, Joker is only allowed to guard during combat, with the only attacking option being an all-out attack. Any other rules will be explained or added during the run, so without further ado, let's start by playing Persona 5 Royal by doing absolutely nothing. And right off the bat, our first battle in the casino offers us no choice but to attack. You can guard and the shadow will constantly attack you with fire, but if your health is way too low, the game will skip the shadow's turn, making you have infinite turns. We have no items to attack, and guarding gets us nowhere, so we have no choice but to attack for the first fight. The second fight, however, we don't have to do anything since this student named Yoshizawa will finish off the battle for us. Soon we get arrested and have to choose the difficulty. 
Most people say hard is actually the harder difficulty than merciless, because merciless offers us triple the amount of damage for exploring a weakness, technical, or critical. And while this is a double-edged sword as it can get you and your party members insta-killed, it's argued to make the game much easier if you already know the shadow's weakness beforehand. However, for the sake of this run, I'm gonna go with merciless for three reasons. One, you do less damage dealt to an enemy than you would on hard difficulty. And two, the double-edged sword will be more against us since we can't choose how our party members choose to attack on Act Freely and we can't attack at all with Joker. So triple the damage is more trouble for us and not so much the shadows since we have dumb AI. And the third reason I choose Merciless over hard is because we gain 20% more experience than usual. And honestly, can you blame me for wanting to reduce my time grinding? And if it can be done on Merciless, this challenge can be done on any lower difficulties, including hard. So unless we face the impossible, we will always have the difficulty set to Merciless. I named Joker after the master of winning by doing absolutely nothing, and I tell Sai how I became the most wanted criminal by doing nothing to earn it. I tried standing up for a woman getting hit on, but that got me arrested. So I just decided not to do anything else for the rest of my life since doing stuff gets me a criminal record apparently. I get a free room where I don't have to pay rent, get introduced to a confidant that I'm going to stay away from entirely, eat some delicious curry and coffee so my breath smells bad for the first day of school, and somehow end up in a castle with this vulgar boy. We get sent to prison, and Joker awakens to his persona because a pink panty wearing teacher is way too much for us to handle. And our first fight sadly leaves us no option but to attack these enemies. With no way to repel damage, we do what needs to be done and carry forth. We run into this cat with an attitude and release him because he's so cute. And with the second fight, we can finally start doing battles by doing nothing. I knew you were an amateur. Aw, you're too kind, Moana. Thankfully, he is able to handle the shadows in both the second and third fight himself and will heal himself if his health is too low. We escape the castle, but Link here wants to go back into the castle in the hopes to fulfill his perverted dreams. And if you thought the run begins on April 18th, who oh boy, you would be wrong. As said before, we can ambush enemies as long as we let Morgana do all the work. However, after the first safe room, the second enemy will have two Mandrakes, which are only weak to fire and have too many hit points for Morgana to take down himself. Because of that, I actually died during the second fight, though likely because I started off with a non-ambush attack by accident. Although, you can skip the enemy entirely by running straight to the door. Once we reach our gun tutorial, we are left with no options but to use our gun. But, we can use our limited turn by only firing one shot. From here, we let Morgana finish the rest of the enemies for us while we guard, and my god, Morgana takes forever to take down these enemies because sometimes he'll only fire one shot at a time. We also have a second phase of the gun tutorial, but thankfully, we can guard here. If Morgana is unable to take down the enemies in time, thankfully we can restart a battle after dying, but only if it's a non-optional battle as Merciless will force us back to the title screen during all optional battles. A good chunk of this comes down to luck and whether or not we can evade the Mandrake's attacks. Once we make it through, we have an option to set Morgana on direct commands or to act freely. Direct commands are banned for this run, so we sadly have to endure the computer making dumb decisions by selecting Act Freely. We get our all-out attack tutorial, which forces us to fire our gun, and then we reach the Bicorn fight. Even when guarded, we are scripted to lose the first fight. After Ryuji awakens to Captain Kid, we just guard with Joker, and we let Ryuji handle the fight himself. Oh. So, regardless if you tell Morgana that you want him to act freely, all new party members will automatically start off with direct commands for their awakening battle, and there's no option to change it beforehand. Guarding with both Joker and Ryuji is a no-go since there's no way that Morgana can handle the fight himself. So I start off by guarding with Ryuji, and once it's Joker's turn, we can change Ryuji's tactics to act freely and still have the option to guard during Joker's turn. However, while this strategy might work later for the other Awakening fights, 
There is no way in hell this will work for Ryuji without some damn good RNG. Usually after we guard with Ryuji and Joker and change Ryuji's tactics, Morgana will always Garu the Captain, Bicorn will always lunge at Ryuji, the second Bicorn will always lunge at Joker, and the Captain will always cleave or attack Morgana. After that, the fight can be random, but I've tried this fight more than a dozen times and couldn't even get close to finishing the fight. Even with Ryuji set on Act Freely, he will always attack the Captain first with Electric and won't consider the Bicorn until his next turn. I kid you not, there was only one turn where I got Ryuji to take down both Bicorns, but it was far too late and always led to a game over. While I'm sure this part may be possible with the rules we have for the run, there just doesn't seem to be a feasible way of getting past this fight without some perfect RNG. So, sadly, we do our first rule break of the run and attack one Bicorn with Electric as Ryuji using direct commands, I guard, and I do what I did dozens of times previously by changing Ryuji's tactics and letting the fight play out. Thankfully, Ryuji is smart enough to finish the other Bicorn before going after the Captain, and the Captain goes down slow. Morgana will be too focused on healing up the party members, leaving Ryuji to do most of the attacking. Overall, it was a close call, even with the rule I broke, but it was possible. If anyone can complete this part on Merciless without using direct commands once, be sure to at me it on Twitter. Anyway, a certain student slips on a banana peel or something during school, and apparently it's a big deal to Ryuji as he finds out that Kamoshida is responsible for being a litterer, so we jump back to his palace to kick his ass. For the first fight, we are forced to fire one shot in order to get our negotiation tutorial and obtain Pixie. Literally the only persona we'll obtain through negotiations for the entire run. The second fight forces us to change personas from Arsen to Pixie with no other action commands being possible, including Pixie's Dia ability. So we kill the Bicorn and move on. From here, the fights can be done fine with only Ryuji and Morgana acting freely, and since we did our tutorial for swapping personas, Pixie is our current equipped persona for the rest of the day. There is a chest in this room which offers us a new melee weapon for Joker, and this can provide us an exception to changing equipment without having to do it through the pause menu. So changing equipment via chest will be a legal strategy for the run. I mentioned this trick before in my no social stat run, but one thing you can do to gain experience points before rescuing on is by saving in the safe room and reloading your file. Doing this will place the three shadows you fought back in the first room. From here, we can keep attacking these shadows so that way we have the boys at a higher HP and SP for the infiltration route, but also better stats to make the fights easier. However, there are a few issues that may require you to reload a file if things go wrong. Only Ryuji and Morgana can attack, so dealing with Mandrakes might be a problem. And running out of SP with Ryuji can make Bicorns a very dangerous enemy to face. Running out of SP for Ryuji is the least of our worries, but you want to have enough SP for Morgana so he can heal during On's Awakening battle. I went as far as to leveling up to 6, though if you want to go further, you could get Pixie's passive ability to resist Confuse. Personally, I didn't since it would require another hour of grinding and constantly reloading my save just to make sure that I only get fights with Pixies and Mandrakes without getting hit once. If you have the patience, by all means, go for that skill. But I moved on to On's Awakening fight against Belthagore, and just like Ryuji, on starts off with direct commands. And yes, I looked into the configurations menu to see if I could auto-select act freely or something, but that option doesn't seem to exist. So I guard with On, change On's tactics with Joker, then guard with Joker. Morgana and Ryuji will do their thing, and apparently, the RNG gods smiled upon us as Ryuji evades Magaru, which is his main weakness, so my party members were able to finish off the fight themselves with all four of them standing. Soon, we force a doctor to give us some drugs only to buy absolutely nothing and to never see her again for the rest of the run. We steal Ryuji's bunny and buy absolutely nothing from the airsoft, confusing this gecko why some random kids keep coming to his store. 
And then Morgana forces us to clean the desk and do our tutorial for crafting a lockpick. There's no option out of it, and we can't craft any other infiltration tools, so with one lockpick in our inventory, our main rule is that we must never use this lockpick and still have it by the end of the run. Instead of trying to figure out what chest to open, I figure for a minimalist run, it would be more challenging if we just avoided all locked chests altogether. And so, we can finally start infiltrating Kamashita's palace, which is literally the only thing we're allowed to do. And before we start, we are forced to do our tutorial for Persona Fusions. With Arsene and Pixie being our only two options, we fuse Agatheon, and since all Velvet Room features are banned and equipped in Personas are banned, that means our main Persona for a do-nothing run will be Agatheon. He can resist gun and electric attacks, and only wind is his main weakness. And he can later learn a passive skill to increase the evasion rate against electric attacks. Definitely a crappy persona to go off of, but at least we only have one weakness to worry about, and thankfully can't be exploited if Joker is guarding. On the first day of our infiltration route, we just get as far into the palace as we can go by having all of our party members act freely and Joker doing absolutely nothing but guarding. Even with the tutorials for Baton Passes and Disaster Shadows, Joker's friends are more than capable of handling the fights themselves. We can equip the Judge Mace Pause List for Ryuji which has better attack and accuracy with a low chance of inflicting an enemy with Confuse. And our last safe room for this day will be before the Heavenly Punisher mini-boss in the chapel. This mini-boss is way too brutal for us as he will instantly kill your party members who refuse to guard during a guarding tutorial. We need to do a lot of grinding in order to increase the chances of evading his attacks, and for my party to do enough damage to keep at least one of them alive. Joker will always be attacked last, so if Joker is the last one standing, the battle is unwinnable. Also, whenever the affinities of enemies are unknown, the party will always use their elemental abilities first before trying physical or gun, and Heavily Punisher resists both fire and electricity, which On and Ryuji will always go for first. So we need a lot of stats to get past this fight. It probably goes without saying, but doing a one-day infiltration route is definitely not possible for this kind of run. And even if it is, I'd strongly ill-advise it since you can't do anything else to pass time in the real world. Using our limited timeline for each palace is our opportunity to gain experience points and improve our party members, and it's always best to be over-prepared than just simply prepared. And the more they learn the enemy's affinities, the more efficient they'll be when we face off against them again. For the most part, that is. So, we just grind till our party is out of SP. Despite Joker being full of spirit points, as there's nothing he could do other than just stand back and watch. The later enemies obviously provide the most experience than the ones earlier in the palace, and some areas are better for certain characters than others. For example, going through the dining hall area will have more Kate Sith appearances who are weak to Morgana's Garu attacks, and the Incubus in the East 3rd floor building are weak to On's Augie attacks, so even if this run has you doing nothing, you are still strategizing for the most efficient way of gaining experience points. Be sure to save in safe rooms because mistakes, misses, and dumb decisions can happen. The RNG gods will not always smile upon you. And when you gain the ability to make shadows beg, you cannot do all-out attacks, so you have two options. Ask for an item which can range from okay to literally useless, or return to a battle to finish them off for experience. However, the latter can be a risky option if you know it's their turn next. Money and gaining personas are absolutely useless since we can't buy anything from the shops and we can't switch personas from Agatheon. Once we've completed and drained our friends by offering no help, we return back to reality and hop in the palace the next day. And still are unable to take down the Heavily Punisher. So, we do some more grinding. This time taking a chance against Birth in the East 3rd floor building, which I strongly do not recommend doing, as this fight is entirely RNG based. However, there is one interesting thing with On once she knows that Birth resists fire attacks. 
she will actually use her Dorima spell to put Birth asleep, which can potentially skip his turn and offer technical damage since any attacks can exploit a sleep and status ailment. After grinding all day on the 19th and getting level 10 with Luigi and 9 with everyone else, we return back to reality where we go back again on the 20th. I go after Birth again, but then I learned something quite crucial for this run. The points for agility will determine the positions of your party members which can really make a difference in a fight. Usually Joker will always be first since Agatheon has really high agility, then the characters from right to left will go next. Since On goes third, she will put Birth to sleep and Ryuji will attack before Birth has a chance to attack. This puts us at a severe disadvantage. So if you want a great advantage, you want to wait till On is the fourth person to go because she can put Birth asleep before his turn, then it will be Joker's turn, and usually Birth will have his turn after Joker's. This can put Birth in a loop where he won't be able to attack and you can finish him off with all four party members standing. However, even with knowledge of this advantage, RNG is heavily relied on as there is potential for characters missing and things to go wrong. And if Ryuji inflicts Birth with Confuse, On will instead go for a melee attack which can make Birth no longer Confuse. So the potential to get technical damage can be wasted since Confuse can only be exploited with Psychokinesis. Needless to say, there's a ton to learn out of playing the game this way and my god it's frustrating as hell. Because if a character has a chance to go for a hit, most of the times they won't go for it if a character's HP is too low. And if someone's HP is too low, Morgana and On will prioritize their turn to heal in that party member, even if it's a bad idea from a tactical perspective. The only exception is if there's an enemy that they know has a particular weakness. For example, On will Augie the Incubus because she knows she can exploit their weakness that way, but she won't use her gun at Pixie and instead always use healing as a priority. It's stuff like this that makes Persona 3's gameplay style age like milk. It's so awful to play this way that you have to train yourself to play the game differently in a way where you have no control over the AI stupidity and you can't do anything to make it better. If my voice doesn't sound enthusiastic about it, that's because doing all this grinding is boring as hell. And it's only gonna get worse from here. So, after I drain my party member's SP, we finish grinding till Joker is at 11 with Agatheon, learning his last skill to dodge electricity, which he already resists. The rest of my party members are at level 10, and I so happen to have received a revival bead from one of the negotiations during a shadow begging for his life. We return back to reality and come back again on the 21st. This time, we go after Heavily Punisher. So Joker does what he does best. Put his arm in front of his face even though Heavenly Punisher will always get him last. And as mentioned before, none of the other party members guard so one hit is an insta-kill. On dies, but gets revived by that revival bead that we got from the negotiation. This is a save in grace because soon, Morgana and Ryuji go down and after one last charge, on had just enough damage to finish off the Heavenly Punisher herself. After that, we gain our first Will Seed, and while these can restore some of your SP, there's really no point in getting all three Will Seeds since you can't equip accessories for a do-a-nothing run, and fighting the third Will Seed bosses are tough foes, guaranteeing death, or just a huge waste of SP, so it's best to avoid them. But in the meantime, we go through the central tower and receive Kamashita's eyes. Along the way, we open up two chests containing revival beads. These are extremely important to keep for the fight against Kamashita, so if one of your party members uses it during their time grinding, you want to reload the last save because you'll need these revival beads when fighting Kamashita. And with that, we secure our infiltration route on August 21st. And with that, we drain our party's SP and return back to reality. When an infiltration route is secure, we have a choice of going back to a palace without sending the calling card. And so, I spend the 22nd to do some more grinding, particularly grinding between the throne room safe room and going down to the central tower safe room since Archangel is weak to electricity, Angel is weak to gun, Succubus is weak to wind, and Incubus is weak to fire. 
be sure to save between safe rooms in case of bad RNG as the characters, for whatever reason, won't use gun against a disaster shadow of Angel, and we continue to grind till everyone reaches level 13, except for Morgana who died the most in my fights. And the reason I'm not gonna grind Morgana to level 13 is because he learns the Lucky Punch, a small amount of physical damage for 3% of his HP with a high chance of critical damage, and you can't crit boss fights. So I grind till Morgana is just barely at level 13 so that way he won't use this move and constantly screw up the fight. I don't know if he will go for that attack, but I want to be on the safe side. With our grinding done, we send the calling card the next day and go change Kamashita's heart on the 24th. Make sure your last save is before you send the calling card because if you need to grind for more experience, you don't want to save and accidentally softlock yourself in a save with a permanent unwinnable fight. So once the fight starts, we guard with Joker and let everyone else act freely. And for the most part, it ain't that bad. Joker plays the perfect sponge so he is least likely to die out of everyone, and everyone does what they're supposed to do while Morgana and On only heal if anyone's health is below 40%, and Morgana will use Media to heal everyone. And for the first half of this fight, it goes smoothly, and when Kamashita uses the limbs from the Chalice to heal himself, the party members will attack the Chalice doing what they're supposed to do. It goes fine until we reach the first major roadblock. When Kamashita calls Mishima in for the kill shot, you're supposed to guard for this part. And, wouldn't you know it, the characters actually do guard. Minus Morgana, who sacrifices himself to heal the others. But that doesn't last long as two hits from Shio ends the first attempt. What sucks about getting past this part is that you're supposed to attack Shio so Kamashita can't kill you with his kill shot. However, as mentioned before, if anyone's health is too low, and it will be from the first kill shot, On and Morgana will always prioritize healing over attacking. For example, On heals, Ryuji attacks, and Baton passes to Morgana who wastes his turn healing up the party who could have ended the fight right there. But nope, he heals and attacks without the boost from the Baton Pass, which causes us to get the kill shot again. Now, when a party member gets KO'd, a party member on Act Freely will always revive that fallen member. And as mentioned before, we need to make sure to conserve two revival beads that we got from the chest. Once these revival beads are used up, any KO'd members will be permanently out of the battle till either Joker or Kamashita goes down. But running out of revival beads is not the worst part. For one, you will need good RNG to get through this fight. But also, if your party runs out of SP during the final phase, Morgana and On will not be able to heal, and apparently they never consider using any of the health items I have on me. Either because the best I got restores 30% of health with Lifestone, or the computer never considers items that are not revival. So, unless they decide to do so later in the run, the party members will never use items for healing. This fight took me four attempts with only two attempts making it past Shiho. All revival beads get used up and all SP from my party members gets drained. It was a close call as Joker only had 3 HP left, but my party managed to finish off Kamashita, with only Morgana being KO'd. Thankfully, a successful attempt only takes 15 minutes to beat, and with that, we can confirm that it's entirely possible to beat the Kamashita arc by doing absolutely nothing. Although, I did have to use a direct command with Ryuji once during his Awakening battle, which has the possibility of being skipped. I mean, maybe we can do it on normal difficulty. Otherwise, we're six saved hours into the run, and it only gets harder and more repetitive from here. Kamashita then gets on stage and bends over for Principal Eggman to do him. We are forced to sell the medal for Yen, and get foreshadowed with a storyline that we never get to see. And at first, I wanted to name my team Luigi Party, but it wouldn't let me, so I just went with nothing. We get rank 1 with Mishima, and while we do automatically get rank 2 with him later, sadly, his first rank ability will be the only one we'll get to use in the run. Sajiro then gives me the keys to the place, which is thoughtful, but I'll hardly ever use them. 
and we are forced to start rank 1 with him if we haven't started his confidant before May 6. Sadly, rank 1 is worthless since we can't use personas and there's no ability at rank 1. Then, we finally unlock mementos on May 7th as we do our one and only mandatory mementos request of the entire run. And Nakapuka here can really do quite the damage to our team with his sledgehammer. One hit kill in Morgana and limiting our healer to on. It's a tough fight that I lost the first time round, but thankfully got it on the second go with only Morgana getting KO'd again. My god, you stupid cat. And so, with our first and last mementos request completed, we grind on the floor for a while, which, may I tell you, was dangerous as my last save was on April 24th. If I died, I would have to repeat a shit ton of days and cutscenes to sit through. But thankfully I didn't die as we meet a mysterious boy who keeps mispronouncing his name. My name is Jose. It's pronounced Jose, you little shit! On May 9th, we can finally start infiltrating mementos optionally as we get our first optional mementos request called the Bark and Bite of a Bully. But as stated before, all optional mementos requests are banned even if our party members can finish them off without Joker's help. And so, we jump in during pollen season. Pollen can put Shadow's Wonder in the Rail World to sleep, making them easier to avoid or to ambush, but sadly, this does not include Shadows within battles, which would have been really great. And apparently, it's mandatory to talk to Jose at least once, since On refuses to leave the first floor until we talk to him. God damn it, On. We gain the stamp book, and as mentioned before, using the cognitive buffs or his shop is banned for the run. And just so you know I didn't cheat, I will also make it a goal to resist every single star podium for every single floor we go down. We complete a full block and return to grind some more on the 10th. The most threatening enemies will be the Aberion and their goddamn critical lucky punches, so be careful when grinding. We take the exams by answering every question with A, spoilers, the first answer is always the wrong one, then we meet the biggest decision I have to make for this run, Dr. Takatu Maruki. We automatically get two ranks with him and gain the Detox X ability. Now, this is the biggest question that I want you, the audience, to answer in the comments below. Should we break the rules of the run and max out Maruki's Confidant? Because as most of you already know, we need to max out Dr. Maruki in order to unlock the third semester. If we don't max Maruki out, we can at least get the vanilla ending no problem, but by maxing Maruki out anyway, we can still do the vanilla ending and onto the third semester. The only benefit we have in this run from bonding with Maruki is getting a higher chance of the Detox X ability to happen at rank 9, otherwise the Mindfulness and Flow ability are going to be useless. And I can't guarantee that my party members will use the snacks that Maruki gives to us. So what do we do? Do we follow the rules of the run and make this run shorter? Or do we max them out anyway because if we don't, we'll never find out if it's possible. What do you guys think? But while you're given an answer, be sure to give this video a like, comment, and subscribe, and ding the bell for more Nitsa Gamer content. Be sure to follow me on Twitter, and that's all I can really say because, oh my god, I'm so exhausted, and we're only one pouse into this goddamn game. Oh, this run is gonna be the end of me, but without further ado, let's get on to Madarame's Palace. On May 18th, we jump into Madarame's Palace, and we get one of the most useful, royal exclusive abilities of the run, Persona Traits. For Agatheon in particular, we have a decreased chance of getting inflicted by status ailments, a pretty useful trait since Joker will unguard after getting hit once, so this extra bit of protection can be very useful, but our party members also gain Persona Traits as well. For Ryuji, he can sometimes increase a party member's physical attacks by 40%. For Morgana, he can increase the healing effects from any party members with healing skills. And for On, she can decrease the SP cost when using skills. All of these will be of great convenience and help expand the time we have to grind, since Joker is going to be doing nothing to help out. So we go as far into the palace as we can go. 
And by far, I mean only get to one safe room and go no further than where the treasure demon is. If we destroy the treasure demon, we can get ourselves a lot of experience points. Sadly, the only two ways to knock down Regen is by getting him with Nuke or getting a critical. You can add Nuke to any party member with one accessory you get prior to the fight, but since we can't equip accessories for the run, our only option is to have Morgana crit a Lucky Punch without fail. So to increase the chance of that happening, we grind for the rest of the day till everyone's SP is drained, and come back on the 19th to get the Treasure Demon Regent. Be careful not to get caught by the Shadow Joker only, or else you'll softlock yourself into a game over. Stay away from both Shadows and just focus on getting to the Treasure Demon. Everyone will test out their elemental abilities first before Morgana goes for a Lucky Punch. However, he doesn't get a crit and acknowledges that Regent is resistant to physical attacks, so he will only use Wind for his next turn. And sadly, this is not enough to defeat Regent. So we reload a save and do the whole laser thing again and try again. It should be noted that Morgana has to be the first one to try out physical attacks or else he won't do the Lucky Punch. Thankfully, we get a crit on the second try, and that was enough to defeat Regent and gain 360 experience points. Totally worth it. We continue on and gain a Will Seed to increase some SP. We fight another Treasure Demon, but sadly, we can't defeat it. Even though Morgana was able to get a crit beforehand, he already acknowledges from the last fight that Regent resists physical, so Morgana and everyone else will only use their elemental abilities, which is not only not enough damage before Regent flees, but it's a huge waste of SP. Because of that, I actually recommend not search in searchable objects since you can only gain treasures to sell at the airsoft or craft materials, and both shops and craft and infiltration tools are banned for the run. And once you reach the courtyard, do not enter the courtyard. As most of you know, Madarame's palace has you doing one third of the palace before doing two inescapable battles against the security and the shadows during Yusuke's awakening. And since we can't do anything, we're gonna need to prepare and grind for these two battles. So don't enter the courtyard till you feel confident you're ready. So we grind for the rest of the day and head home. Then we grind all day on the 20th. After the 20th, we go to the 21st and do even more grinding. But we're faced with one annoyance. Morgana loves to confuse enemies. Yeah, once he learns the Palimpa skill at level 19, he will almost always use it unless there's an enemy weak to gun or wind. This wouldn't be so bad if we could use the Confuse for technical damage, but only Psychokinesis can exploit confused enemies, and one hit on an enemy makes them unconfused. Only once in a rare while can it be useful to skip an enemy's turn, but most of the times, we have to deal with Morgana confusing an enemy only for On or Ryuji to unconfuse them. Most of your time grinding will be Morgana wasting his SP on using Palinpa, and there's nothing you can do to stop him. And the only way to get rid of the Palimpa skill is to learn a skill at level 24. So we continue to grind on the 21st, the 22nd, the 23rd, and the 24th. Heck, on the 24th, Ryuji will visit Maruki to tell him how much it sucks to do everything for a friend while that friend doesn't do anything for you. Just don't tell him that we might bond with Maruki though because he might insta-kill me. When Ryuji returns back to hell, we have him and our party attack. Morgana has a bigger crush on Palimpa over on, and all while Joker cowers on the spot. This is boring as hell, but it's as close to efficient as we're gonna get with this kind of run. So we grind to level 21 where Ryuji is now able to learn the Mizayo skill, and we head to the courtyard to start Yusuke's awakening. Make sure your last save is before you enter the courtyard, or otherwise you could softlock yourself into two unwinnable battles. On the 25th, we get on to do all kinds of poses for Yusuke, while our first battle with the security has only Joker and Ryuji attacking. This battle is pretty easy to finish if you have fire skills, but we can only rely on Ryuji's brute force and the RNG gods to get us through the first fight. We lost the first round, but with better RNG and a fair share of Joker having a weight fall on his head more than once, Ryuji was able to finish off the fight himself. 
Once Yusuke rips off his mask and awakens to Goemon, Morgana gets replaced by Yusuke for the Awakening battle. And what I thought was gonna be a long fight actually took a minute and 30 seconds on the first try. We guard with Yusuke, change Yusuke's tactics to act freely and guard with Joker, and apparently the RNG god smiled upon Ryuji once again as he was able to crit the blacksmith with Rampage. And so we were able to end the fight quickly with only Ryuji getting KO'd. <laughs> I guess the RNG guys have a sick sense of humor, huh? Once we return back for another infiltration route, this is where we will have to break one of our rules in order to make progression possible. Once we have Yusuke in our party, we have to start off with Joker only and have to manually choose who joins us and who is a backup member. You can try going in Joker only if you want, however you will be hindered by two mandatory mini bosses and entering the first one, Sally does not add the party to the front lines. So in order to continue our doing nothing run, we have to break one of our rules and decide who stays with us and who becomes a backup member for probably the rest of the game. This is the first legit choice that can determine your next 100 hours of gameplay, so you must choose wisely. Well, right off the bat, I knew I wanted Morgana and On in my party for sure. With On having a persona trait that can reduce SP costs and magic skills, a sleep and status ailment that can be exploited with any attacks, healing magic and Augie skills that can inflict burn, which Morgana can use when for technical damage, On will definitely be in the front lines of battle. And despite Morgana wasting his SP on the Palimpa skill, he has the best healing abilities out of any party members in the game with the Persona trait to increase the effects of healing magic which also gives reason to keep On in the party. Essentially, On and Morgana really work well off of each other. And no, not in that way you sick perverts. Right now we need to keep healers in our party because if the later Awakening Battles forces all healers in the back lines, we could softlock our save in a situation where we can't heal during boss fights. So keeping both healers is likely a smart choice. Also, if we're able to keep Morgana in the party long enough, we might be able to use his confidant skill since he's the only party member who ranks up through story progression. No promises there though. So now the big question is, do we go with Ryuji or Yusuke? The two are similar in nature as they both have physical attack abilities and both freeze and shock can be exploited by the same type of attacks, though an enemy will remain shocked when hit, unlike a frozen enemy. Ryuji's trait is to occasionally raise physical attacks by 40%, while Yusuke increases the chances of dodging physical attacks. On top of that, Yusuke can learn a passive skill, Counter, which gives him a small chance to repel physical damage. The skill for Counter alone makes me want to go with Yusuke, however, I ultimately decided to go with Ryuji. Why? Because there's more chances of Ryuji's trait triggering than an enemy causing physical damage to make Yusuke's trait useful. On top of that, Shock could further delay an enemy's turn and have multiple opportunities to get more than one technical damage when fired at with guns, unlike Freeze which will instantly go away when hit once. And also, the time we spend grinding with Ryuji far exceeds where Yusuke is at with level 15. Usually this wouldn't matter, but in a run where our party's limited SP determines the amount of time we have to grind per day, going with a guy who's already far ahead is probably the smarter strategy since Madarame is going to be one of the hardest boss fights in the game. So my final decision is to stay with the original four and have Yusuke be a permanent backup member who I will never use for the rest of the run. Once we make our decision, we cannot turn back. And right at the start, one of the chests contains a revival bead. Reload your last save and save this revival bead for later when we fight Madarame. Soon we face up against our first mini boss and holy crap these monks are merciless. The Monk of the Valley will do a multi-Garu attack which will insta-kill Ryuji and apparently be powerful enough to kill On. And if Joker is attacked once, he unguards, which puts him in a vulnerable position. The fellow monks are only weak to ice and can use taunt to force our party to do physical attacks only. 
Morgana's wind attacks are worthless, and with Joker being no help at all, this fight will be the next thing we need to grind for. I tried a good amount of times to pass this fight with no luck, so we have two options. Switch to Yusuke instead of Ryuji, since my last save was when I made that decision to stick with Ryuji, or grind till we can pass this mini-boss. Changing party members now is not a smart idea. Sure, Ryuji will die instantly in this fight, but just like the fight against the Security Shadow, we need to brute force our way through with the highest level party members we got, since switching party members is banned for the run. And on top of that, we need to be prepared for the Madarame boss fight since it's going to be one of the hardest boss fights on Merciless difficulty, so worrying about a mini boss is not the biggest concern. So, we grind on the 26th, the 27th, and on the 28th, we go after the Monk of the Valley again with everyone at level 22. And remember when I said Morgana was freaking annoying for using his Palimpa skill? Well, Onthod being annoying as well makes the game more fun because whenever there's a buff on an enemy, she will always use Dekaja to nullify all buffs. This wastes so much time because it's the only move she will use regardless if it's just one enemy with one simple buff. Thankfully it took only one try to beat the monks, but with good RNG as Ryuji was able to shock the monk, and Morgana was able to get a technical and one critical. Ryuji goes down, and An still won't stop using the damn Dekaja. But with two more crits for Morgana, we were able to win the fight and move on. We managed to do the rest of the palace no problem and secure an infiltration route. But since Madarame is going to be one of the hardest boss fights on Merciless difficulty, we're going to use every single day we have to grind. If that sounds insane, trust me when I say, it is. We will need to do the park cleanup event on the 30th and we will have to send the calling card on June 3rd. Which means, other than what SP we have for the 28th, we will have four full days afterwards of grinding, with our party member's SP being the limit. Sadly, facing treasure demons is still a no-go since my party won't do enough damage and Morgana will refuse to lucky punch since Regent resists physical attacks. Even if you were to drain all of Morgana of his SP, he will only use melee instead of lucky punch. So while grinding, I would still advise against search and searchable objects. Instead, I recommend grinding the two shadows between the hook and the treasure room and where the lever is. The enemies here are weak to electric, wind, and fire, which all coincidentally happen to be my current party member's main attacks. So just fight these two shadows, save and reload in the safe room, and repeat. Drain everyone of their SP and move on to the next day. Also, one thing I always wondered about is if it's possible to change Madarame's heart on the 30th where you do the park cleanup event, since it's possible to postpone Kasumi's awakening to October 4th if you change Akuma's heart on the 3rd. The answer? Well, Morgana says that sending the calling card on the 29th is not a good idea because the park cleanup event. So in case you are wondering, there's your underwhelming answer. And let me just say, I legit felt dumber and mentally drained grinding while doing nothing. To call this boring would be an understatement. You have no idea how much I wish I could use the insta-kill ability, which would have been a saving grace on this run. But since we're not allowed to do anything, we have to grind every day till everyone's SP is drained. And in reality, it drains my sanity. I really do not look forward to doing the rest of the game this way. And we're only two palaces in. You have no idea how draining this is, and I strongly do not recommend it. I mean, sure, I could be doing what Tevin did by getting up to level 99 in the first palace, but I don't have a big following, so I gotta do what I gotta do. And since I'm doing a nothing run, we do the 31st, June 1st, June 2nd, and June 3rd where we- wait, Morgana, what the hell? So, despite the calling card deadline being on the 3rd, Morgana will refuse to let you enter the palace on the 2nd. I don't know if this is a failsafe for the last 3 days or something, or if this is just my party getting pissed at me for forcing them to do this every day. But yeah, we can't infiltrate the palace on June 2nd if we have a route secured. 
And I need to grind a bit more since Morgana and On are only little ways away from getting level 25, with On learning Fire Break. So, what do we do? Well, even though Morgana refuses to let us go into the palace, there's nothing stopping us from jumping into mementos. So yeah, our last day grinding is spent grinding on Kamashita enemies which gives you less EXP than what is said. Oh god. But I did the grinding, got everyone to level 25, and send the calling card on the 3rd. And we arrive on the 4th, and now, the moment of truth. Is it possible to beat Madarame on Merciless by doing absolutely no- Oh, wait, oh shoot, I forgot the revival beat from the chest. Oops, don't forget this before starting the fight. So, with only one revival beat and everyone at level 25, we see if it's possible to beat Madarame on Merciless by doing absolutely nothing. Ugh, sorry. Okay, sir, sorry. Take it out! The first fight was over in a minute and 20 seconds, and that's the most you're gonna get at. Yeah, this fight is fucking impossible on Merciless. Well, yes, it could be possible if you grind with the insta-kill ability. There is no way we can make any progression in this fight despite our hours of grinding every day. I'll have to link these fights in the description below, but you can see for yourself that beating Persona 5 Royal by doing nothing on Merciless difficulty is not going to be possible. Heck, it may not even be possible on hard difficulty because of Ryuji's Awakening Battle, though I give that a pass since it's technically part of the tutorial. So, what now? Well, seeing how Merciless is a bust, we have to lower the difficulty. On hard difficulty, we can do a slight bit more damage than usual, and we won't have the triple damage buff that will insta-kill us, but on the downside, we gain 20% less experience than on Merciless, so for the rest of the run, we have to permanently play on hard difficulty, seeing that Merciless is impossible. So, how is Madarame on hard difficulty? Well, definitely more survivable than Merciless, that's for sure, but still pretty damn brutal. Just like the rest of this run, everything relies on good RNG, and at level 25 on hard difficulty, it took me 5 tries to beat Madarame, with 3 tries not being able to make it past the paintings. So, I'll talk about the successful attempt. The mouth drains physical and gun, the eyes drains the first 4 magical attacks, and the nose drains the last four magical attacks. But knowing this does not matter as your party has to figure out those affinities for themselves, and Ryuji makes a smart move by using Rampage on all four paintings, enough for Morgana to bring down the nose. And since we can't exploit the weaknesses, more often than not, a painting will restore a quarter of health to any KO'd paintings, which drags out the first phase, and on, using the goddamn Dekaja again. At some point, Madarame will inflict one of your party members with black paint, and the one who gets blacklisted will be weak to all affinities for one turn. If they can survive one turn, then the RNG gods are on your side. After the second person gets painted black, we come up with the idea to paint Madarame himself with black paint, a scenario that I'm seeing for the first time myself as we need to get through two turns with only Ryuji and Morgana. I sent on for obvious reasons. And with one painting left, she paints the last eye with black paint. Any fallen paintings that get revived will not be painted over, but with luck on our side, we manage to get through the first phase without any KOs. And now, onto the second phase. The easiest part of the fight if you have direct commands, but an absolute nightmare to sit through on Act Freely. Thankfully, with the party having multi-attacks, they can find out sooner what the affinities for all the elemental Madarames are. Each one will repel two affinities and is neutral to one and is only weak to their opposite affinity. Eventually, it gets to a point where only four fire Madarames remain, and with no one having ice, all On has to do is use Fire Break on these enemies and use Miragi to finish them off. But instead, she is too obsessed with using the damn Dekaja because there's always one enemy with an increased buff. Fighting here is obviously dangerous since Madarame can still use Black Paint against you, 
but this time on two party members. And the fire Madarames have a chance to inflict burn, which can drain your health every time you make a move with your party member. Despite the fire Madarame being neutral to wind, Morgana will never use Magaru and will only focus on healing or using Garu on the true Madarame himself. So it's pretty much on using Dekaja, Morgana healing or using Garu on Madarame, and Ryuji using physical attacks on Madarame. It was a close call, but we managed to finish the Madarame boss fight on hard difficulty by doing nothing. Five tries, all party members standing, and didn't even use the revival beat on the fifth try. Sweet. And with the one party member we left out leveling up. <laughs> so with Madarame's heart stolen, we're two palaces into the run. With a total save time of 17 hours, which is definitely not how long I spend doing this challenge run, we're at a time of WHAT?! 54 and a half minutes?! Oh my god, I am so sorry guys, I am- I did not mean to drag out a doing nothing run like this, but... Let's just say this is a reflection of how repetitive this run is for me. But this is where the first part of this run is gonna end, so if you want to see the next part, this is what I want you guys to do. Give this video 1000 likes, more than 50,000 views, and get me to 10,000 subscribers. If you guys can get me to those numbers, then I promise I will do a continuation of this run. But in the meantime, be sure to give this video a like, comment, and subscribe, and ding the bell for more Nitsa Gamer content. Also, special thanks to Patreon backer, Jack Berta. If you want your name mentioned at the end of the credits, be sure to donate to my Patreon. Check out the Egg Paladin who briefly appeared in the video, and be sure to check out some of my other videos, including the Persona 5 No Social Stat Run. So be sure to share this video around, give me a thousand likes, 50,000 views, and 10,000 subscribers. If I reach those numbers, then I promise I will do a part two. In the meantime, be sure to check out my other videos where I will actually be doing something for once. Thank you so much for watching, and goodbye.